Hi, Klaus. Good afternoon and welcome on board. Hey, how's it going, Enzo? Ciao. Hi, Scott. Hey, Hi, everyone man. else. Hey, Klaus. We, we're having a very hot conversation here with Anne-Marie, Jan, and uh, and Sharad, and Scott. So looking forward to continuing this conversation, get to more, more about ideas, revenue solution. So I'll leave the word to Scott, and uh, let's start this interview. So first of all, Klaus, good to see you again. Welcome. Always good to see you. Um, before we start talking about the specific uh, topic today, what I was hoping you would do a little bit is just sort of shed a little bit of light on your career. And I think probably the best way to do it is you're the second person I know that has the term evangelist in their actual title on LinkedIn. Uh, the first is a data evangelist uh, that uh, actually we've spoken about already on the on the session today. But kind of what's that all about? Where's that come from? And, and tell us about your role in ideas. And, and yeah, thanks. Uh, well, I've been in the industry for about 30 years now. Well, I shouldn't mention that. That uh, gives me my, my age, probably more than 30 years, including school, as I went to a hotel management school. Um, worked most of my time in hotels and then moved to uh, revenue management and pricing, uh, helped set up uh, the function for intercontinental hotels group around the world. Um, and then I moved to Ideas um, uh, a few years ago, 2010. Um, started setting up a consulting business for ideas and then led the innovation partnership uh, group there. And then I was appointed chief evangelist uh, a few years ago, which um, is all about these kind of things, interacting, um, having a conversation, having a dialogue with the industry and um, understanding where the trends are going, where the industry is going overall. And then hopefully for ideas to um, help shape the, um, the roadmap uh, in technology revenue management and pricing um, and helping the industry get to all these great things that i've just heard about over the last uh, 20 20 minutes that i've been listening in so man I, I mean i was super excited about this conversation because you know i know each other a little bit and i know that role puts you in a really gives you a great opportunity to talk to a lot of people and it's very similar to mine i became a professor and all of a sudden people that were my competitors and my peers were my competitors and my friends now all of a sudden, instead of not wanting to share anything, now they want to bounce ideas off me. And I, and I thought I was going to be disconnected from the business. Actually, it's I learned more this way, not being connected to it. And I'm sure your role is very similar, right? So you've got this really, really cool kind of just wealth of information that you pick up just in your travels. And, and uh, you, you're in California now. I mean, I, I know you're all over the world a lot of times and you and I've met each other in a lot of different places. So like with all of that kind of accumulated ball of yarn that you've accumulated in the last six months or a year, like what's up with revenue management today? What 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 is the real function like? It's obviously, you know, two years ago, <laughs> we were managing excess demand and that's obviously changed, but what, how does it really work out specifically? Yeah, you know, listen, I've, I've been in revenue management since 1998. And uh, both at the hotel side, at the corporate side, and now with ideas for the last few years, and I've never been I've never been more excited about the opportunities for revenue management or commercial leaderships as I am right now. I think technology has never been better. The the, the cross functional interaction has never been better. The understanding of revenue management and pricing and how it contributes to success has never been better. Um, and we have seen over the last 12 months an endorsement of what, what I've just heard here in the panel too, an endorsement of revenue management, pricing and commercial functions and, um, and processes to the success of the industry going forward. So I think we're, we're in prime time here in revenue management right now. <laughs> Absolutely. I think I think we all agree. By the way, other panelists definitely don't hesitate to jump in at any point. That's why... Uh, that's why we've got you guys here. Uh, but let's let's kind of roll on with that, Klaus. Like, what, what do you think is going to be, you know, obviously some changes have been made from COVID. We've talked about ancillary revenues and focusing on other things. But when it comes to sort of the impact on revenue management, so what do you think is going to be the lasting? Some of it's just defensive and disaster control. And the minute we can stop doing it, we will. Or the minute we can start doing it again, we will because there's resources. But, like, what do you think the learnings are? What, what's, what's, how has the best practice evolved? From what we've learned yeah I, I think i think the key change from 2008 or 2003 with sars in singapore um or other downturns is that this is not a this is not a this is not an economic recession um this is a government imposed restriction on demand and uh what we're seeing is this this um, this incredible pent-up demand I, I just saw statistics this morning 
uh, that France alone had $146 billion in, in additional savings that people will, will be spending on, on experiences and travel, of course. Uh, the UK has $250 billion in, in excess savings, and the US has $1.6 trillion in excess savings accumulated over the last 12 months. So ultimately, those savings will be spent, and where people spend it most or, or first, or one of the first items is experiences, which means travel. And um, we have seen a, a big discipline in revenue management and pricing uh, compared to 2008 and 2003 or 1999. People have held their prices steady. People have understood that this is not a question of demand uh, that has gone away. It's a government imposed restriction. The demand's still there. It's just people can't travel or people are restricted from going anywhere. And as soon as that is lifted, we'll see this huge rebound that we're already seeing in the US and we're starting to see between Australia and New Zealand and in other countries around the world and China as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, very, very, very different, right? What you know, what is pent up, and and I think all of us would agree. Uh, I know the next three trips I'm taking. I just don't know when, um, which exactly. is kind of a new phenomenon, right? It used to be, I knew my vacation. I had to figure out where I was going. So it's completely changed the way with the way consumers look at travel and the way we plan travel. And uh, I saw a statistic that in the state of Florida, that restaurants and hotels, there there was an estimate that they actually collected more than 50% of the second stimulus check that went out in the United States. <laughs> so people got this money and they went, ah, oh, I gotta go out to dinner. I gotta go stay in a place. I gotta get away. So so there was tremendous- The first 50%, the first 50 was, gained in, was, was gained or lost in the stock market. So the other one went <laughs> oh, and tried. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Depend, depending upon your age bracket, possibly Bitcoin, but still it was lost. It was gained or lost right. somewhere. But uh, but yeah, there was a lot of that pent up, that pent up kind of stuff. So um, we talked a little bit about different market segments and you have visibility into a lot of hotels and visibility into, but frankly, a lot of very different types of hotels and the market segments that they're dependent upon. So where do you see like, you know, the Florida hotels, as we mentioned, you mentioned some of those doing great, right? Because it's opened up, there's good domestic leisure business within a couple hours of most of them, but there's other types of buildings that don't benefit from that. I mean, if you built a beautiful resort on the beach in Thailand, Oh, you don't have a lot of great domestic business, and so you're really hurting right now. So, how do you see some of those hotels started? You know, what, how long does it feel like it's out there? I mean, the major thing you guys do is forecast, and then, yeah. like, what shape does it take, really? Do you think? Yeah, yeah. So we have visibility into fifteen thousand hotels, which are which are clients around the world, and, and we have built some some very um, very cool dashboards uh, right at the beginning of COVID to give us and our clients visibility in what's happening. Um, you know, within their client. Uh, portfolio, or for us, we can see obviously all fifteen thousand uh, uh, hotels around the world, and 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 you're right. You know, I, um, I see and I hear from CEOs of hotel companies that I interact in that uh, anyone who has a resort in a domestic drive to or leisure destination is uh, very lucky right now. Um, I've talked to a CEO recently who said his um, his portfolio of thirty five hotels, which are all luxury leisure hotels. Uh, ADR has never been higher than, than in the last few months, um, and uh, they're driving um, demand and ADR very aggressively. Obviously, if you're a big box city hotel, I'm thinking about the uh, the Marriott Marquis in, in Times Square or the Big Sheraton or Hilton that have thousands of rooms uh, sitting in, in Manhattan, we'll have uh, quite a difficult time for a few more months, so maybe another year. Um, but if you have the right mix of leisure hotels and leisure destinations, and um, and drive to destinations, then I think you 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 will see that rebounding very very quickly. I was just on a on a trip in California last week, and I stayed in in a hotel, and it was full. And it wasn't even a a, a resort; it was a a roadside motel we stayed in for one night, just on a trip. And um, the hotel was packed. So um, even even those smaller hotels, I think, as people are starting to pick up again and start traveling, we'll see a, a faster rebound than we all expect. So just staying on those bigger hotels, kind of the more doomed ones for a little while. Are, are you seeing anyone do anything really, really interesting that, that that's changed, moving the needle, or is that just about cost control and patience? Do you think? No, I think I mean the Palace Hotel in New York has recently reopened. One of our clients, you know, they're doing reasonably well. They're 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 putting some special packages out there. Ian talked about all the all the innovative and new ways how hotels are using space. Uh, which is great, and I th think we, we will see that continue. You know, a hotel, a core has this great concept of augmented hospitality, which I think has has been very innovative and has been driving kind of the conversation in the industry to a different level because it's not just about hotel as a room, but it's 
it's it's about the hotel as a space that you can use in different ways and then you can actor factor in the community that you're in and bring in services and 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 experiences from around the hotel so i think what accor has done specifically uh for the last two years is kind of being validated now as we're looking at how you can utilize the community and the hotel asset in different ways um so i think I wouldn't call any hotel doomed. I think doomed is somebody who doesn't have the right strategy or the right out of the box thinking. Because even if you're sitting in a big in a big city in a big hotel, you can still use utilize that asset in many different ways. So you mentioned the New York Palace. Uh, it's actually a great example, right? Because the New York Palace, uh, not only are they building innovative packages, but they incorporate it really, really well in their content management strategy too. There's always they they talk about things that are coming up two months from now. Um, then they, it's in the blog. There's a package that's built around it. Like they really do a nice job tying it all together. And, and I think it's a pretty good example for the future because it shows how you can drive your marketing um, based on experiences, right? Because those are all based yeah. on events and experiences. They're really, really well done. That's a great example. And, you. and you're raising a really good point because the other thing that I've been talking about a lot to see the C-level executives that I, that I constantly talk to is this convergence of revenue management and marketing, right? And, and, this is driving right now what we're seeing is an acceleration of that convergence we need to bring these teams together it's no longer marketing sitting here and revenue management sitting on the other side we need to have a better integration and interaction both on the people side and on the technology side as well um, and, and you're giving a great example at the palace and i don't know many many companies are working on that as we speak revenue management systems need to speak better with marketing systems and crm systems and the revenue managers need to be speaking with the marketing teams and need to be integrated you bet ian i was just wondering if you wouldn't mind commenting on and getting involved in the conversation a little bit right based on based on your uh, your perspective I, lo I love i love that last comment i mean uh, <clears throat> i mean i'm i'm not a pure revenue manager so i I'm uh, I'm I am not a fraud but uh, i am uh, i'm not a pure revenue manager like you guys are here but i've um, I spent a lot of time, certainly, on optimizing uh, search, uh, organic, SEA, SEO, and uh, and working on the CRM side of the equation and all the marketing clouds. And I was uh, just having a conversation, probably a year ago, with our revenue management team on the absolute need to prioritize. Now, of course, COVID hit, but the absolute need to to start converging these uh, these different skill sets, doing some co heavy cross cultural sharing, and and probably swapping jobs so people can really understand what happens on both sides of the fence because it's a terrible shame today to actually have the pure revenue managers on one side and then you've got people that are optimizing the consumer on the other side and at the end of the day i think as Marie was saying there's also the, the people in it that are building the technology to kind of interconnect all these data feeds and and frankly today we are leaving probably billions of dollars on the table in terms of unrealized value either because we're overpaying on buying customers on online or or we're actually probably under realizing benefits because we're not managing the total revenue correctly so i i couldn't agree more with klaus this this to me is is one of the central areas where we need to be investing in uh in, in the short to medium term yeah pl playing nice is a really a really good point i mean a lot of revenue managers have never experienced this if you've been a, you've been a revenue manager for 10 years until this, you'd lived only in good times. You managed demand. You never really dealt with the need for demand. And so you were the gatekeeper with the sales department. No, 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 right? All this stuff. And I remember telling a bunch of revenue managers right after this happened, uh, you're going to need to learn to say yes, but, and not no, because these people are about to be your best friends for the next couple of years once that business starts to get revived. So uh, so really important that they that they, uh, that they they begin to gel together. So I, I don't know, shared and and. Uh, uh, and Marie, I don't know if you had a, uh, any kind of comment to, that you'd like to share, like to throw in on that. Hi, Klaus. Um, I just sure. want to get your perspective. I mean, you speak to so many people in the industry, uh, especially the C executives. <clears throat> you did mention about the marketing and revenue in certain companies probably coming together. Uh, so there's a convergence of it. Um, do you believe that revenue still is being seen largely as a data processor, data reporter, uh, or is there now a mainstream role that is coming across uh, the industry? Because the industry is quite fragmented and just not composed of big chains. Uh, that revenue management really has a role which is more commercial and just not a data, data only uh, uh, role. And, and the second question that I have for you is, 
that, uh, I mean, Anne Marie uh, pointed out earlier in our conversation today, which is uh, a lot of revenue folks were uh, feeling the heat of the pandemic because they were either didn't have revenue to manage, which was the primary reason that they, they were either furloughed or they were without uh, uh, their roles. Um, how do you see that across the spectrum of uh, the industry? And uh, you, you seem very positive about it. Uh, what has changed? Yeah, yeah, and Shard, you and I, we had this conversation about commercial leadership about six months ago on my podcast, right? So um, I, I do believe that people are generally looking at a more commercial leadership perspective rather than just re revenue management in isolation. And commercial means driving all the taps you know, that you have at, uh, at your disposal, marketing, distribution, sales, um, uh, and loyalty, right, to some extent. Mm -hmm. Um, so that the, 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 the level of growth and the level of visibility of revenue management is definitely growing as, as, as a key component of commercial strategy. And, and it's been a consistent theme that's been accelerating over the last 12 months. Um, at the same time, what I'm seeing is that the, I think the revenue managers, um, even if they haven't moved into commercial leadership roles, the demand on revenue managers and revenue leadership to provide insight and guidance um, and rational decision making has never been bigger. Uh, revenue managers are typically the, the custodians of data. They're the ones where people go to or who people go to um, to ask, uh, show me what's going on or just Scott ask me, you know, what are you seeing in your forecast? Um, and they have, there, there have been an increase in requests, there have been an increase on demand there, uh, on the revenue managers, and there have been an increase on the number of shareholders or stakeholders that are, that are asking revenue managers or revenue leaders for input. Not just the general manager or the sales teams, now it's the asset manager, it's the owners, it's the banks, um, and anyone in between who's asking, tell me what's going on in the hotel, tell me what the forecast is going to be, tell me when are we going to get back to uh, a more stable environment, and the revenue manager is typically the person that can provide those answers. Klaus, you make a really amazing point, and we have Ian here as the perfect poster child, not child, poster man. Um, for, <laughs> I will take child, I'm getting older, I will take child any day. <laughs> for, for the fact that with those two traditional roles that we used to have, if you think about a revenue manager and a director of hotel sales or director of sales and marketing, then what, what the revenue managers little by little became the digital marketing expert because they were the one that understood how to work the computer the best. And we just slowly evolved into more of that responsibility. And now, Ian, you're a perfect example of someone that comes from another industry that brings those, maybe not the revenue management skills, which you acknowledge, right? The supply and demand management piece of it, but all the digital stuff and the understanding of the data comes from the marketing side as well. So the opportunity is for revenue managers today, get it together, become a big picture chief revenue officer, right? Make revenue happen. And for the salespeople today, guess what? Embrace a little bit of analytics and some of that kind of stuff and, and understand that one of them can be your wheelhouse, but you have to understand all of them really to, 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 to really be successful. So Klaus, uh, give you an opportunity if you don't mind. Lots of really, really interested people, lots of expertise there. Kind of let's close with three things that revenue managers should be doing right now to get ready for when things get better. Yeah, I think you need to build, build your strategy. If you have not built your strategy for the rebound, you're too late already. I think um, you need to have it all wrapped up and you need to understand exactly uh, what your phases of recoveries are going to be, where your segments are going to, uh, which segments are going to come back first and how that's going to look like. And you need to understand what are you going to do through each of those phases of recovery with your marketing team and your sales team and your distribution and everything else that goes. If you haven't done that yet, you're already too late because the window is closing very, very quickly. I think you need to make sure that you have the right data in place. Um, and hopefully the last 12 months, you've spent some of your free time to clean up your data and make sure it's all well connected and integrated. Um, and the last one, I think uh, you need to make sure that you have um, uh, your, your technology infrastructure and your platforms integrated and, and communicating with each other. Make sure you have whatever the right revenue management system is for you, Hopefully you have a cloud-based CRM, you have a cloud-based uh, 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 customer data platform, uh, marketing automation tool. You should be ready to go and roll and push the buttons when you see demand starting to materialize again. In some markets, that's already happening. In other markets, like in Europe, it's going to happen as of May and April, or May and June. Um, be ready for the roller coaster because it's gonna be a wild ride. 
<laughs> That's right. So I, I think you're exactly right. I think if you're looking at a computer screen and typing into a computer keyboard, you're driving a steam engine to work and it's time to time to you know get something new. Time to move on. It's not that hard. So great, Klaus. Thank you very much. And thank you, panelists. You're welcome. Thank you, Klaus. Really, really appreciated your contribution. Um, I'll hope to see you again soon on uh, on our channel. And um, at this point, I say bye. Thanks, Al, Klaus, and uh, Thanks, let's see you next one. Anytime. Thank you. Thank well, you.